Your personal growth has to happen through just getting in there and doing it. And so a lot of people beat themselves up because they make a lot of mistakes. But when it comes down to it, the basis of financial literacy of, you know, building wealth is go get a job, make good money, invest that money, however you're going to invest it and continue to grow your income, continue to invest, and then just let time do the rest of the work. And it's very similar to social media and that is people. People expect results immediately, but it takes a long period of time to see that progress, to see those results. And I think that's where a lot of people go wrong is they're looking for the quick hit. I try and do the 40, 40, 20, invest 40% of my income. I save 40% of my income in CDs or a high yield savings account. And then I make myself live off 20%. And that's been huge for me. It's helped me one, understand that you really don't need all the money that you can do things with a budget and you could still have a really good time. Welcome back to the Virtual Ventures Podcast. I am your host, Andres Sanchez, and today I have the pleasure of talking with Curtis Haney. Curtis Haney is the author of the Frameworks and Finance newsletter, which goes out to over 20,000 subscribers. He just mentioned that to me before we hopped on, so I want to say congratulations to you, Curtis, on crossing that milestone, and I'm extremely excited to have you here and get to really chat and learn a little bit more. This is also a selfish interview for me. I love finance and personal finance, so I'm interested to hear what you have to say from that perspective. And something I always forget to do is like, subscribe, comment, follow, do all that good stuff for me, help me continue to grow and get Curtis's story out there. So Curtis, thanks for coming on. Nice to meet you. Yeah, good to be on this conversation. It was, it's a little bit weird hearing you say 20,000 because that literally just happened today. And so every milestone is like, you know, turning over a new leaf. It's kind of fun. So that is awesome. Well, I'm happy to be able to be here with you today and inaugurate that 20,000 with an episode. So I think that's really cool cool. But I think uh, an easy way to start is I just like to learn a little bit more about you. Yeah. So I've started, you know, I went to college accounting background. And once I graduated college, I kind of went the traditional, I guess maybe a little bit non-traditional as I chose not to go to CPA firm. And I went to big to just a big accounting or sorry, a big company with, you know, in their accounting department. Yep. And when I did that, I realized pretty quickly in that job that I enjoyed more than just the accounting aspect of stuff. And so I went to a smaller company and became the CFO of that smaller company. And so that was kind of my career. And I was, you know, enjoying that. I really enjoy the aspect of kind of being at small to medium businesses and, and being involved in a lot of different elements of the business. And then about, you know, COVID happened. And then, you know, about a year and a half ago, I decided, hey, I'm going to start a podcast because I enjoy talking about personal finance, business finance. I enjoy these topics. So let me just share. And then I realized with podcasts, it's it's hard to get traction because you are, you know, there's really no easy way to distribute. And so I started on Twitter and Twitter, I was just kind of sharing everything that I've learned through the years. And then that turned into my email newsletter, Frameworks and Finance, which is now turned into, you know, me doing fractional CFO work, kind of going with my day job. And so it's been a fun journey and something I didn't expect, but I I've just kind of followed wherever the passion has been. I've followed wherever the traction has been, and I'm just trying to figure things out as I go. So that's amazing. And one thing that you've mentioned, and I, I want some more clarity on what is this fractional CFO work? Yeah. Sounds really cool. Um, I'd love to kind of learn a little more about that. Yeah. So the reality is, is most small businesses, you don't really have to have necessarily a CFO level person until you're, you know, 15, 20, 30 million in revenue. But businesses before that point have significant needs that are similar to what a CFO would provide. You just aren't making enough money at that point to be able to justify hiring someone at that level. So fractional CFO work is saying, hey, I have the experience and background that can benefit you, but I'm only going to work for you a couple hours a week or whenever you need it project basis. And so it allows businesses that are earlier in their journey to get expert level advice and really only get that stuff that honestly truly is the value delivering stuff at a much earlier phase than 
than they normally would have. And so I just use my expertise or, you know, use my background in 10 plus years, you know, as a CFO and help them kind of, you know, navigate those areas that they don't know uh, or don't have exposure to. Nice. That's super cool and a really useful tool for startups. So I love that from that perspective. And it's a way for you to continue to grow and, and learn more as you get to get involved with a ton of these businesses. So that's awesome. I guess we can start at the core. You said Twitter's like your main growth engine. I just had your buddy Clint on Sunday. His episode will be coming out next week. So we kind of dove in on how to grow on Twitter, how that kind of journey was. I'd love to hear from your perspective how growing on Twitter was and and how it's been a growth engine for you on the yeah. newsletter and your personal brand. Yeah, so Twitter for me was always a consumption thing. And I've been on Twitter since I think 2009. And it was always, I come here to get the news. I just take in kind of the different news sources. I try and keep up with what's going on in the world. And then I think it was, let's see, was that 2018 or 2019 timeframe? I guess it doesn't really matter, right? Is I took a break from all of social media. And so I took a break from Twitter. I was not on Twitter for probably two years ish. And when I started my podcast, I said, I have to find a way to promote this. How do I want that to look like what I want that to look like. And Twitter was the platform that I enjoyed the most just personally. And so I made the decision, okay, I'm going to hop back on Twitter, but I'd never been on Twitter as someone who was creating it. It always been someone who's just consuming stuff. So I was basically starting from zero. I had like, you know, less than 200 followers that were all just family and friends. And so I very quickly realized I had no idea how to grow. And so I, I got into personal finance circles, just kind of interacted with people, but I still was not posting that regularly and I still was not growing. And so through that process, I started just DMing people that I saw in the comments along with the kind of big influencers at the time that I was commenting on. And actually one of those people was Clint. And I don't know if he talked about this at all, but it was me and him realized we had such similar backgrounds. We had similar desires to grow. We were both doing a podcast. And, and so we kind of connected on those things. And through that, I found some other groups, some other people. And it was just kind of like a chain of connections that then resulted in me finding groups that were doing the same thing as me trying to grow. And then it was through that that I realized this is a full-time job trying to grow on this social platform. Yep. I got to comment every single morning on people's stuff because that's how I get seen. I got to produce all this content. I got to figure out all these you know, specific things. And over a period of time, what I came to realize, and I'm not the first person, I won't be the last person, but Twitter, when it comes down to it, is a networking application because yep. it's building relationships with people. And when you build relationships, people then comment, they look for your stuff, it, that then deepens it. But then that also provides traction for other people seeing your stuff because those circles of influence then help spread you out to other people. And so I kind of learned how to play the game of growth, slowly but surely gaining followers. It took me probably three to four months at minimum to get to a thousand followers, another three months to get to 4,000. And I was at, let's see, I guess December 2021, I broke 4,000 followers on December 31st because I'd like made that my goal nice. at some point. And then from there, I just kind of continued to put out content. And then in May, 2022, I put out content on business finance. I talked about financial statements and it went extremely viral. And I went from, you know, I gained over 10, 15,000 followers in a matter of 48 hours, 72 hours. It was kind of then off to the races. And then that kind of completely changed the whole trajectory. Cause at that point I was doing well, I was growing, but it still seemed like it was going to be a long time before this really meant anything. And it was yep. like overnight, it was like, wait, I may have something here that I can use. And so that kind of changed the, the whole trajectory. And, and I guess was kind of the beginning of the story, honestly. So that's awesome. And that's what I love about social media is like you're one tweet away, you're one reel away, you're one TikTok yeah. away from having this exponential growth. And I think, I mean, Clint might get me wrong on this, but I think he said that his first year, it was like 4,000 followers, kind of like you. And then his second year it was 200 
260,000 followers gained. Yeah. I mean, 260,000, yeah, followers gained. That's insane. Like, that's huge growth. And I personally love Twitter as well. Um, and I did it the same way that you did. I was strictly a consumer, not really somebody who used the platform other than in high school just to mess around because that was the cool platform when I was in high school. But now I went back, started using it, and I love it. I love to tweet. I love to comment under people. I've made a lot of really good relationships on Twitter, just reaching out. Twitter's been a great way for me to get guests like yourself on the show. So I'm a huge fan of Twitter. I'm a huge fan of building a personal brand on social media. It's definitely something that I'm starting to work on. And really, the, this podcast is at the core of that. Let's talk personal finance. I know that's something you're passionate about. Maybe start and we'll let the conversation take us from there. If there's a listener that's listening right now that's looking to work on their personal finance, get ahead of the game, what advice would you have for them? Yeah, I mean, most people, I, they've not grown up in an environment where they, they even have the foundation. And for me, I'm grateful that I did grow up in that environment. I had parents who were, were very smart with their money, taught me a lot of the foundational things, You know, had me at a young age earning money, figuring out how the whole system worked. And But unfortunately, Fortunately, for a lot of people, they don't have that ground. And so they get out into college, they get out into the real world, and they just really just are clueless when it comes to personal finances. And I will just say, for me, despite having that background, despite knowing all of those things, I made all the same mistakes that everyone else makes when they come out. Mm. And when it comes down to it, your personal growth has to happen through just getting in there and doing it. And so a lot of people beat themselves up because they make a lot of mistakes. But when it comes down to it, the basis of financial literacy of you know building wealth is go get a job, make good money, invest that money however you're going to invest it, and continue to grow your income, continue to invest, and then just let time do the rest of the work. And it's very similar to social media in that is people expect results immediately, but it takes a long period of time to see that progress, to see those results. And I think that's where a lot of people go wrong is they're looking for the quick hit. And that really is just the nature of our society today. And um, it's, it's consistency over a long period of time that creates the results. And obviously you have to make the right decisions, but if you get that foundational stuff right, the rest of it will come in time. Yeah, I really couldn't agree more. And like I said, somebody who's passionate about personal finance, sometimes I feel like I'm pushing it on the people around me for the right reasons. And I still live at home working on moving out now. I love being at home. I have a great job. I'm just working on saving as much money and getting ahead. But I'm I'm on the more aggressive side of things because I can be right now. And I try and do the 40, 40, 20. I invest 40% of my income. I save 40% of my income in CDs or high yield savings account. And then I make myself live off 20%. And that's been huge for me. It's helped me one, understand that you really don't need all the money and that you can do things with a budget and you could still have a really good time. And then two, it's been interesting because when I want to do more things or I want to be able to spend more money, I find myself not dipping into my savings, but trying to find other ways to up my income so that 20% goes further. And I think that has been huge for me because it's helped me. Because I used to run a few companies when I was in college. COVID kind of messed all that up. And then I took a little bit of a hiatus and then got my regular day job so I could start building things like this. And it's kind of like re-sparked my interest in side gigs and the side hustle life. So I owe a lot of credit to that. But I know it's really tough for people because it is a long game. People think that they should see the gains in the first month, two, three months, and then you tell them that they should be looking at a 30 years out. And that's usually where I lose people right there. It's like, what do you mean? I got to put money away now that I'm not going to see good results for for 30 years. What is that? That doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, well, let's talk about compound interest. And then you, you know how that conversation goes. But from your perspective, what have you seen? I know you said some people just don't grow up with the right framework around around them. Maybe that's the answer, but what do you see as the main thing holding people back when it comes to personal finance? Yeah. I mean, I think one of it is knowledge and it's the fear to have a conversation around money. Our society does not talk about money well. And I think that's a big deal. But then I also think you just look at this consumerism nature that the U S especially has. And I think what you're doing is, is really good because it resets your frame, right? We need those things that break our frame to make 
make us rethink things and you living on the 20% is a great frame breaker, right? Yep. Like it forces you to think differently about how to achieve your goals, which you just said was the case of trying to pick up that extra income. And so I think most people, unfortunately, they don't challenge themselves in that way. They don't seek out the other answers. They just are kind of going about their day doing the minimum. And that's why I think the Twitter space with everyone talking about personal finance, you know, you're impacting people because even though they may not impact, like they may not respond, they may not talk to you. You're making them think about things in a way that they haven't thought about. And even me being a CFO for 10 plus years, teaching personal finance to people locally, as well as online, like learning from people on Twitter, reading what people write has honestly re made me rethink some things, made me think deeper about some things, or maybe didn't even change the way I thought about it, but it just changed the, the language that I used around it. And so there's so much power in exposing yourself to that stuff. And I think just the ma majority of people are just kind of going through the motions, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately, I would have to agree with you there as well. And again, touching back on Twitter, I personally became more exposed to personal finance. That's kind of how I even got here. I met Wolf and Wolf Financial. He allowed me to come speak on some spaces with very little credibility, but it was something I was passionate about and thought I could go up and talk about. And he gave me my chance and let me come up weekly and I started to make that relationship and he introduced me to people like yourself with that one tweet. And I think that is like the power of Twitter, like we said, a networking app. But I posted one clip of Wolf and I. He mentioned you guys in that clip where we we're talking about growth. He tagged you guys below. You all saw it. And now I've booked you, Clint, and Steve for my yeah. show, which is super exciting. And I, I just think that's such a cool, I think that's why it's so underrated. And the more I got exposed to personal finance or finance Twitter or FinTwit, whatever you want to call it, it was amazing to see the experts and the people that you get to interact with and or even the threads you get to read, man, you learn so much and so many things get put into perspective that have really shaped me and helped me continue to grow because I'm always looking for an edge. I'm always looking for a way to save more, invest more. And I think Twitter has been a huge engine for me on just becoming much more savvy when it comes to my finance. But I want to pivot and highlight the newsletter that we talked about it. Yeah. Huge milestone just accomplished. What was the journey on building that? How did that kind of come to fruition? And, and let's maybe talk through that. I technically started my newsletter back in September-ish of 2021. But when it really kind of took off and it took a life of its own, when I really actually started treating it as a serious thing as a business was when I mentioned about the growth in May of 2022. And I grew really Really quickly on Twitter. And I said, now it became a fear of Twitter is my only thing. And if Twitter is my only thing and something happens to Twitter, then I'm done. Like I have nothing. <laughs> yeah. and so I decided to pivot and relaunch my newsletter at that point. At that point, I had, you know, cover like a couple, you know, probably less than a hundred subscribers to my previous newsletter because my previous one was just, hey, I'm just going to talk about whatever I want to talk about. If you want to go join me, you can, you know, and it was like, it was more just for me. It wasn't, you know, anything that I was actually trying to provide value. And so because business finance stuff, financial statements was something that hit really hard. I said, I'm going to pivot my newsletter and I'm going to talk about business finances in this newsletter on a weekly basis. And so when I pivoted, I immediately started getting to the mode where I was like promoting it every week. I was making it more of an event and that eventually turned now into kind of its own business where I'm really really, if you look at my focus at what I think is the main thing, while I've got a ton of followers on Twitter, the newsletter is where I see the real value. And if you look recent history with newsletters, there have been multiple multi-million dollar exits big time exits out of newsletters because yep. they've built hundreds of thousands in audience. And so when I looked at it, I said, honestly, the newsletter is what I love because I love the long form writing and the newsletter is really an asset, a business into itself. And so in May, 2022, I started treating it as that and that growth started slowly. But then about, I guess, November of 2022, I switched to Beehive, really, again, doubled down on what I was doing with 
with the newsletter, working with other people to help grow the newsletter. At that point, I had 7,000, I think 6,000-ish subscribers, which has led to today where I've got just past 20,000. And so that's kind of been the journey. I'd love to talk you know, more about that, whatever questions you have, but that's kind of the overarching theme. Yeah, no, that's great. And one of my favorite podcasts, My First Million, I know Sam exited yeah. a, a huge newsletter. I've always been interested in starting a newsletter. I love to read. I just feel like I can't find the time to write. And honestly, like I'm putting myself on blast here, but <laughs> I'm not the best writer. It's definitely something that I lack in and something that I'm actively trying to get better at. But I know how sticky a newsletter community can be. And this is something that I talked about on a few episodes. And then I talked about on a podcast that I have with two of my friends. I think that these kind of creator followings and creator brands are going to just take over because you have access to your like ideal customer base at the click of a button. And I think you see that with huge companies at scale, like Prime, Happy Dad, like all of these, like what we thought were funny, like, oh, look at this YouTuber, like making a brand. And it's like, holy shit, it's in my Publix now. It's in my Walmart. Like it's everywhere. So where do you find the time to write when you have all this other stuff going on? Or has that just become like a non-negotiable part of my business type of situation? Yeah, well, that was a little bit of my bet too. When you mentioned the kind of the personal brands, I think traditional media has become less trusted and less trusted, right? Yep. It's because people don't have a relationship and they don't know their motives. They know they have a profit motive, but they don't know their motives otherwise. But as a creator, while you may have a profit motive, if you're not being true to what you actually believe, you can't develop a relationship with people and you want to attract those people. And that's how you're really going to monetize. And so while you may have different motivations too, people feel like they know you at a personal level, which means they're going to trust your recommendation, trust your thing more than anything else. And so that's the power. And I think that's, we're going to continue to see that. Going back to your question, for me, I had to sacrifice other things, meaning I still produce a lot on Twitter, but I had to cut back my Twitter time. For me, writing the newsletter is like a sacred Saturday morning habit that I have now. Like I had to tell my, I had to tell my wife that we were going to do some stuff. And it was like, I think it was like around lunchtime on Saturday. And I just said, listen, I can't have every week be a negotiation or conversation of whether I'm going to do this. I either need to have this time on Saturday morning or this time somewhere else that can literally be a non-negotiable. And it's not that she was trying to do anything bad. It was just like, I know if I don't set that boundary for me, it gets squeezed out. So for me, that Saturday morning became my thing of every Saturday morning, I'm going to write my newsletter that I spend kind of probably so Monday, I still have my day job, even though I'm kind of transitioning out Monday during lunch, I do my editing Tuesday evening, I do a little bit more editing, really refine it to then go out on Thursday. And so I kind of base the whole rhythm of my week around the production and trying to get out really solid content on this newsletter. And if I didn't do that, actually, I'm taking off this week. And I told my audience that it's the first time I've not written a newsletter in over a year. And it's been because I set that side, that time aside and made it that priority. Nice, nice. And do you have like, are you monetizing the newsletter? Is it strictly just grow, grow, grow and look for an exit? Maybe let's talk about that. Yeah, so I struggle with the idea of an exit on a newsletter because to me, that's my platform. And if I lose that, then it's like, so I would, you know, honestly, I'd love the idea of it just because it's, I'm a business guy. So I just love the economics and the thought behind it. But the way I monetize it right now is strictly through ads. So um, every week at the top of my newsletter, I have one ad. I've been selling those anywhere between $300 and $500 a week, which is, you know, not a ton of money, but it's pretty weird to think that I'm making money from a newsletter when a year ago, I wouldn't even have known that was a model, a business model. Yeah. But going forward, the plan is to continue to monetize with ads, potentially create a paid tier of the newsletter, which I have not figured out yet the model of what that's going to look like. I've played around with some ideas just in my head, but I haven't, you know, kind of landed on what that's going to look like. And then I'm releasing courses in the coming months that are going to teach people basically how to just translate financials in their business, uh, think about them 
strategically kind of trying to just take the edge off of not un- think people thinking they don't understand financials. And I'm going to monetize that through my newsletter as well. And so I think ultimately it's going to kind of be a multi-pronged approach to how I'm monetizing. But right now I absolutely, I am prioritizing for growth over monetization. So I'm investing actually in like last three weeks, started investing in paid ads and really trying to look at how to grow and pull levers that way. Because what you see is that the momentum that you get from growing quickly on a newsletter really compounds on itself. Mm. And it just like kind of keeps moving quicker and quicker. And so I'm trying to use that to my advantage because if I can get there, I can look and say, well, if I can continue to invest six months a year from now, I'm at, you know, over a hundred thousand dollars just from ads over 200,000 from subscriptions, you know, people paying for the, you know, the paid portion. And so when you look at that, it's like, I'm not in the position where I have to make money from it right now. So I might as well reinvest everything I can into paid growth and really try and like go back to what we talked about early, really try and make a business out of this that that can be a foundation of everything that I launch off of. Yeah. And the more I hear you talk about it, I feel like the one of the great plays here is like the scale of your fractional CFO business because you're educating all of these individuals who have clearly signed up for the newsletter because A, they like business, they have a business, they're passionate about business, their mom and dad, their kids have business. I feel like the more trustworthy you become and the more people read like your fractional CEO business could scale so fast just because it it turns almost into like a consulting business even if you go and do a 30 minute call with the so is that one of like the main goals here as you continue to grow this audience? Yeah, I've struggled with that honestly for a couple of reasons. One, even with like so with a fractional CFO role the way most of those firms and the way I plan on building my firm is you just charge a monthly rate and with that monthly rate they get a set you know deliverable but in a sense while you're not directly exchanging time for money you're still in an indirect sense exchanging time for money because if you're not spending any time on that client they have no reason to continue to pay you and so while I do want to grow that and I do need to grow that to keep my hand in kind of just what's going on day to day in a business it provides it actually provides me with content so that's great right so I want to continue that but I've struggled with is it a thing that I want to scale or is it a thing that I want to keep like a VIP high level service and then have the courses have the newsletter all of those things be kind of the business that I'm focusing on optimizing and so I don't know that I have an answer right there. I've had a thought of, you know, I can, you know, I can absolutely scale it. I think there's probably no problem with scaling it. But the question is, do I want to run a business? Because scaling it, business from the sense of scaling, it means I'm going to be supervising people. Scaling, it means I'm going to have all of that. And so it's just a question of what do I want? And so honestly, I'm trying to work through that right now. But that's what's great about the position and where I've got with the newsletter is it's provided me those questions that I now have to answer. (laughs) And so I'm trying to not push myself to, I've got to have an answer. I'm trying to just let it kind of take shape on its own and just kind of see what I'm enjoying doing and and where where I'm more passionate and then just kind of chase those things. Because if I can build it in that way, then I won't resent what I've built and I will, you know, kind of wake up every morning enjoying getting to do what I'm building. So actually, like now, the more you talk through that, I like the idea more of using the courses and using maybe webinars. and and easier things to scale as your more mass audience approach and still being able to monetize that and then keeping your fractional CFO a high ticket VIP type of service. You saying that actually like now to me makes way more sense. And the more I've gotten exposed to like a bigger circle of high net worth earners and, and bigger entrepreneurs, it's funny when you tell them about a business or like when I've talked about businesses, it's like, wait, how much are you charging? You're charging 500 bucks? No, there's no way there's no way to get rich charging 500 bucks charge five thousand dollars and in my head i'm like oh my god there's no way like i couldn't justify i feel like people always sell themselves short like there's like i couldn't just i'm not worth five thousand dollars and then you do it and it's like whoa like i got this whole new client base who like saw the five thousand dollar ticket and that actually fit their budget and they were interested and then i went through with it and it went really well so like maybe maybe i am worth five thousand dollars so i love that idea of courses and all that stuff as the mass media media mass like way for you to go to market and then really vip high ticket fractional cfo work it sounds like a great business honestly well, and we break
break our own, like we, it goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning, is we have our frame of what is affordable, of what the pricing should be. And we look at everything through that frame. And the reality is, is there are people who have a completely different context, a completely different way of looking at things that have a completely different frame. And you have to raise your prices to be able to even see that frame, right? Yep. Because if you don't, they're not going to look at your offer because they don't believe if you're if you're valuing it at 500 and they're going to say well that's not going to be worth my time but if you're valuing it at 5000 you may be delivering a very similar thing but to them that seems like now like that is something that is substantial that pricing delivers the value shows the value behind what you're doing or what you're exploring and it's funny like i struggle with the pricing as well on my own business but i'm coaching people on how to price in their business like so it's you know it's funny it's it's different applying it for yourself than it is for anything else. And, and I'll recommend a book called Think Again by Adam Grant. If you've not read that book, I love that book. Um, it's an amazing book. Anyone that's not read that book should go read that because it forced our ability to rethink is directly correlated with the clarity and the level of our thought. Meaning the more we're able to rethink and redigest what we know or what we're learning to challenge that, the more high level our thinking then becomes. And so I I think for me, I've like, when I read that book, it was kind of like, I was already thinking that way, but it was like, took me to the next level of like, how do I rethink this stuff? So yeah, no, I highly recommend that book to anybody listening as well. It's, it's amazing. And it's crazy how when you start to change the framework of the way you think and the way you kind of analyze things, the results that you see are amazing. This conversation has been awesome. And if you're still listening with us, which I hope you are, I hope you're writing things down. I hope you're taking a lot of these nuggets and really keep keeping them so you can consume them because I think this is really important. And I appreciate you for just being so open and free. Like, I don't think people understand like somebody who's been a CFO for 10 plus years now coming out, giving free content, free game is extremely valuable. Something I like to do at the tail end of all of these episodes is take us away from the business and just ask a super simple question and you can answer it however you want. I've gotten answers from what they're eating for dinner at the end of the day, or I've gotten answers extremely elaborate about life and different things. But the question is simple. What are you excited about in the near future? Well, for me personally, I think what I'm excited about is I'm going through, I mentioned that I'm making a transition on my job. And to me, what I'm excited about is leaning into all of those transitions. And I think oftentimes in life, we shy away from those because we fear change. We fear things that are different. And I think that's all of our natural tendencies. And so what I'm excited about is I have a lot of transitions coming up and it's, I'm excited about leaning into those. And so, yeah, I don't know if that's a, that's a self-reflection esoteric little bit, but it's like, I'm trying to convince myself of that answer, right? Of I should be yep. leaning into those. And so I'll say that. No, no, that's amazing. And I'm the same way. Sometimes I need to say things out loud to kind of get myself going. And like, that's kind of how this podcast came. I've always loved podcasts. I've always consumed them. And I always wanted to start my own, but I was kind of dragging my feet a little bit. And then I finally just made the leap and said, I'm going to stop procrastinating and just do it. And I kept saying it out loud to people. I kept saying, Hey, I'm going to start a podcast. Hey, I just want to let you know, like I'm going to start a podcast. So the point that I was like, Holy <laughs> shit, if I don't do this, like I look like a loser. Like I just told 20 different people that I'm going to do it. If I don't actually do it, then I look like I just made it all up. So I was like, all right, I got to do it. And now we're here. So I totally understand where you're coming from, from that perspective. And I just want to thank you for coming on the show. This episode has been amazing. I'm going to have all of your descriptions, your socials down below in the description yeah. but people are really lazy so maybe read out what your ad is on social media or your website to kind of capture those people yeah i mean just my name is curtis hanny curtis with a k hanny h-a-n-n-i search for that on twitter that's where i'm going to be most active that's where i'm going to be most responsive and then if you're a newsletter person you can just search frameworks and finance newsletter and you will find me i'll be the first one up on there so yeah i appreciate it was fun conversation enjoyed kind of chatting through these things and best of luck to you as you continue to kind of explore explore this podcast I know I was doing a podcast for a year year and a half and I enjoyed it but I kind of took a break because I wanted to have a very clear direction and I didn't feel like I had a clear direction and so I will be getting back into the medium soon but best of luck to you on that so awesome thank you so much and again thank you so much for coming on the show giving the viewers this amazing knowledge and I look forward to continuing our 
our conversation offline and this relationship. So again, thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you, man.